The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed, and welcome to our first exploration of Other Center. I'm Ken Napsock. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw, and I am excited to dive into the other here with Ken, our first adventure into other topics than strictly Star Wars is uh, Indiana Jones. We are calling this series of podcasts Indiana Jones and the Perilous Podcast. You are currently listening to Chapter One, The Adventure Begins. Ken, I'm very excited for this adventure. How are you feeling? I'm I'm very excited and, and oddly nervous. This is uh, I think a natural extension of, of Force Center discussions. It's such a Lucasfilm property. It's it's steeped in the history of George and Harrison and all that stuff. And I love it. I also don't know it as well, meaning all the little details, every little thing about it. Some of it even escapes my memory banks. Uh, but I uh, I'm excited to be here and nervous as well. Yeah, no, and I know what you mean. Like, there's just even the like, hey, wait a minute. Uh, how many Star Wars words do we say in our intro? Does the center of the galaxy still make sense? Can we do this? Uh, and then there's there is the same thing of like, I love it, and I think I know a lot about it, but not a ton. Not an expert in any way, shape, or form. Not the encyclopedic level of of Star Wars. And even then, there's stuff that we're <laughs> mid episode looking up on old Wikipedia. Uh, so we might be doing some Googling to Indiana Jonespedia, uh, whatever the title of it is, as we go. But as I was writing up some notes and some thoughts, what I realized, what made me really excited is uh, we talk about it always on Force Center, but there's a difference between uh, knowledge of facts and knowledge of your heart. You know, mm. how much you love the thing, how much it makes an impact on you. And that's what I'm so excited about of like, hey, yeah, even if sometimes I have to remember like, oh, yeah, what uh, what? Uh, country does that scene happen in <laughs> yeah uh, it doesn't affect my love of the thing and how much uh, of a place it holds in in my heart yeah and what i'm excited uh, one of the many things i'm excited for this uh, perilous podcast adventure is taking what i sometimes call even to myself off air the force center i and focusing it on indiana jones i think the way we've talked about star wars sitting at the table with you for years has, has changed the way in which i engage with media and, and take it in and so because of that, I've gone back to other things that maybe, ah, you know, I love the Peter Jackson trilogy. I don't know if I love the Hobbit trilogy. And I've looked at it differently and come away with a, a, a deeper appreciation of those uh, Hobbit movies, uh, simply because I'm looking for different things now. Indiana Jones has been in my life for a long time, as, uh, as it has with you. I'm excited to go into the movies with that force center eye, which almost sounds like something that Indy <laughs> would try to avoid on a ride uh, and, and kind of see what else I can learn from something that has uh, been a strong presence in my life. For Yeah, it. tourists, don't look directly at the force center eye. No, I, I know what you mean. It, it has... It, part of the way we talk about things on Force Center is the way that I like to absorb storytelling. I like to enjoy everything that is the straightforward pleasure of how the plot moves and action and comedy and romance and lighting and all those things. But then I also like to really go, OK, but well, what's the intent of all that? What is what are, what are we being told? What are we being asked to believe or or, or wrestle with? Uh, and I'm excited to look at both levels of Indiana Jones because there's so much to look at in terms of the <laughs> immediate pleasures of the films. Uh, but there's so much to be discussed. There's a lot of ideas uh, and history and uh, mm -hmm. just exciting things to talk about under the hood of Indiana Jones. So yeah. that's what we're going to do. We're going to get into it. We're going to talk through our history in this first episode, our history with the franchise, our, our relationship with it, some of the connections to Star Wars, and really why we love Indiana Jones. And then after this first episode, we're going to get into analyzing and discussing the first four movies and build up to the big adventure, the big summertime thrill of Dial of Destiny. So, Ken, I want to go back through the mists of time. What was your relationship with Indiana Jones growing up? What did you What did you first think of it, and how did it impact you? I was terrified. I was <laughs> terrified. So, 
you and I have told each, we each have our own store, Star Wars stories. And I think not just on Force Center, but going on other podcasts, you and I over the years, you, you get asked. And, and I think I have some of the same. I always joke I'm, I'm the uncle at the party telling the same stories you've heard 10 times. But it's because it's just, I know it so well. I was one at the drive-in theater with my parents for New Hope. I don't remember it, but I, I was there in the Return of the Jedi. I saw the trailer, but I got, I got that all down to the second, it seems. <laughs> the only thing I remember about Indiana Jones being introduced to my life was uh, my dad taking me and two friends of mine. And I think the other dad was there too. This is in the Anaheim area. And we went to a very fancy ornate theater. It's, I don't, I, it's not like Chinese theater or Capitan, but it had that vibe, but it was down there. Couldn't tell you where. Uh, maybe my dad remembers. And I went and saw Temple of Doom. That's the first one I saw. Mm. And, I, and I used to joke in the past, and this is something I have said before, I really think my mom's the reason they had to come up with PG-13. Uh, I was <laughs> so terrified and so disturbed about uh, the Mulleron scene and the, and the heart and the, the, the possession. Uh, I, was, I was trembling. So my first thing was fear. But there was just something about him on that bridge in Temple of Doom, uh, mm. some of the, the heroic action. And, and uh, you know, short round and all the stuff, everything about Temple of Doom. It's so weird because we're going to talk later on. And that's maybe not one of my favorites of the franchise now. But then that's what brought me in. So the fear grabbed me, but then I was able to push through it. <laughs> so when, when you went home wrestling with the fear, you, you're describing connecting to how Indy pushes past his own fear and becomes a hero. And you, you see the thrill and the romance and the fun. Maybe Maybe see it a little bit, this film through a kid's eyes because you, you have a short round there for the kid perspective, right? Uh, yeah. So you see all those things. Is the fear something that you're like, ah, I, I don't want to rewatch it because of that fear? Or or do you think about the parts that frightened you in a sort of, this is a, a fun way to explore the darkness? Do you think about the fear or do you just try to block out? Like, I'm going to try to forget the heart taken. <laughs> I am trying to forget it. Terrified. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I think some stuff you talk about is what is there and then, probably connect with me on a level I don't understand maybe even till later. But I, you know, I was the, the, the lady in the dark crystal taking her eyeball out, whatever the hell's going on with that. I'm still <laughs> large margin. I just was a very skittish kid. It was kind of, that point was driven home to me of always be afraid, right? <laughs> sorry, mom. Sorry, dad. Uh, that's kind of the way I live my life. <laughs> and that, that was terrified. Just, and not even the, the heart was one thing. And I just remember asking my dad, can that happen? <laughs> <laughs> so I need to protect my heart. And he's like, well, in other ways, but yes. And then, but it's, it's when you see that, that, that poor soul being like moved down to, mm. in, in, to the, whatever the, 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 the lava that opens up and all that stuff there, that was just terrifying. Cause I was in that situation. Like, what would I be thinking or doing? Knowing I'm going to die this way. Like it just, it just, it, I, you know, I was eight 84, right? Mm -hmm. Year after Return of the Jedi, which, by the way, the Rancor scared me. I, you know, I have a very, very skittish childhood <laughs> I have to overcome. So that, that's that's what I took forward but uh, from that film. But that, to, to your other your question, is like, I think that was there. That's, that, that didn't keep me from going back. And then mm -hmm. learning, well, there's other movies. And Raiders ends with some scary stuff for a kid. Oh, yeah. Um, so, but by then, it just was the whole package had grabbed me. Yeah, yeah, no, a Temple of Doom we'll talk about more, but but it is almost comic how how escalating the terror is, especially <laughs> from a kid's eyes. They're not kidding about the doom. Um, mm -hmm. So when did you see Raiders? Did you did you seek it out? Did you ask to rent it on movie night if your family had such a thing? How did you how did you see the masterpiece Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah, the vague vague memories of that, but it, it definitely was uh, heading over to movies to go on Grand Avenue in uh, Royal Grand California <laughs> and grabbing the, the VHS copy because uh, even though it might have been re released. I did not see Raiders in the theater till the early 2010s at uh, AMC Burbank. They, there was a special screening and uh, me and some of my, my pals went over there and saw it. And uh, I, I did not see it on the big screen until then. Okay. But did, so did you love, did your dad, was your dad and your mom on board with seeing Raiders? If after you'd been terrified by Temple of Doom and, and <laughs> as you mentioned, Temple of Doom, historically, what, that along with Gremlins, the, the summer that, that broke the rating system and they had to come up with PG 13. Uh, even, even with all of that, your parents were like, yeah, more Indiana Jones. 
I think my dad was. I, I think you know he's always been more of the movie fan, and and my mom was more of like, well, we we don't we don't watch Hollywood, uh, and so <laughs> and now we're getting some real issues here. So I think it was that, and and I think um, I think the not to get into real real world stuff real fast, but like you know I don't know. There's a little bit more positive religious overtones and religious love story for the dark side that my mom might have thought. Uh, you know, uh, look, I was raised in an era where like my, they questioned my love of Star Wars because it it, it uh, promoted quote unquote Eastern religion. Um, that was the thing, right? That was something I had to deal with in the mm-hmm. satanic panic 80s like a lot of us did. So it was, we, I think my dad, it wasn't like, a, oh, your mom's gone to bed, let's watch Raiders. I think it was just like, oh, this is fun. And then I and I think my mom loved that stuff too. Like and 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 I think Raiders is just you know, despite its end, a, diff- a different vibe. Mm-hmm. So it was like, all right, th- this is okay. You can continue with this. <laughs> that that is uh, that made, just makes perfect sense. And I don't think it's leaning into anything too controversial yeah. uh, about religion or, or the films to say that Raiders kind of has a uh, a message of hey, maybe respect the might of God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Temple yeah. of Doom is, uh, you know, people descending into what looks very much like the literal description of hell, right? So, yes. uh, some slight differences in tone. <laughs> slight, slight. <laughs> Did you then go uh, to Last Crusade with your father? And if so, did it uh, <laughs> make a difference in your relationship? Uh, I, th- I think we did s- see it together. Saw it, saw it as, a, as a family, I believe. But that was... Summer of 89, like so many people have talked about and mo- probably movie documentaries about this summer. Such a great summer for films uh, of our childhood, our youth, our younger days. By this time, I'm what, in junior high. But yeah, I love that last crusade, as, as we'll discuss. But uh, I, yeah, the positive memories of seeing with my family by then. You know, and again, again, <laughs> what's the message at the end? A penitent man shall pass. A lot of walks of faith. It, it's a different vibe. And, and I think they could get behind it. Uh, a lot, of different, a lot different way than Temple. Yeah. Did it affect you at all to to know that this was a uh, a movie franchise that your dad enjoyed too and this was so much about a, a, a father and a son connecting or did you just not absorb it on that level? No, no, I did, especially especially by then, um, 89. Yeah, yeah, a little different. I mean, we have, um, we're two similar people, so uh, where he doesn't have a lifelong obsession that drove me away, but... Um, <laughs> we're both very stoic and quiet and don't talk a lot. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of like, I, I would not want to be on a Zeppelin with him. Cause I don't know what we talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and so that scene, that scene, uh, I, I love it even, even more. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot to explore there and man, mm-hmm. so much more of that uh, in, in the young Indiana Jones adventures, uh, yeah. The, yeah. the television show. Anyway, yeah, so, I mean, we'll definitely get into, into Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, too, but I kind of want to start more with a, a little bit of our youth perspective since we yeah. grew up when these movies were were coming out. Um, for me, it was a, a really weird journey of Indiana Jones. Was, I was deeply, deeply aware of it, but I didn't get to see it. So it mm-hmm. was a mystery I longed to discover. You know, Indiana Jones mm-hmm. was almost like, <laughs> you know, uh, the the beer that your older brother can have a sip of, but you can't, which only makes it more like, well, what is this? <laughs> are, are you, are you uh, up to bed early and you're hearing the party downstairs? <laughs> uh, it wasn't quite that bad. Um, cause, cause my, my brother was actually withheld from it I- is mm. well. Mm. I don't, so I I've, I've shared this before, but just to put it in context, uh, my parents had both my brother and I very young. They were married at 18, had my brother at 19, uh, had me at like 22, 23. Um, and, and so some of my youth in the eighties is just weird. Um, some of it, you know, when I'm talking to fellow eighties kids, they'll be like, remember this? I'll be like, yeah. And then like, remember this thing that every eighties kid did? And I'd be like, no, not at all. I didn't have a VHS player until 1989. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was very aware of it. It was Han Solo. And I was like, why is, why is Han Solo got a hat and a whip? I must see this. Um, but as I've gotten older, I've, I've pieced together memories and realized that we, they knew that we were obsessed with Star Wars. Uh, mm-hmm. They learned that we were obsessed with Star Trek. So like, okay, we have to take them to those or, or we will shatter their hearts. Right. Um, 
uh, and that was only learned. Be, I told the story of Wrath of Khan, where like it was like a bad after school special, where every other dad and mom on the block were taking their kid to Wrath of Khan today. Mm. So we went outside, and there was like tumbleweed. Like there are no children to play with because everyone else is at Wrath of Khan, uh, and that's how the Star Trek lesson was learned. Mm. Somehow Indiana Jones evaded that, and in retrospect, mm. I realized from my mom's perspective. She took us to movies when other adults were talking to her about them and she didn't want to be left out. Right. Mm. So that's why I saw E.T. That's why I saw Back to the Future. That's why I saw mm. Ghostbusters. I think that's why I saw Gremlins. Uh, it was less us pushing and more my mom not wanting to be left out. So I'll have to quiz my parents uh, about why Raiders uh, didn't didn't make the cut. Uh, mm. Temple of Doom. I, I mean, I remember my mom asking other parents, if there's anything scary in Empire Strikes Back and they were like, well, there's this ice thing and it flaps Luke in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying. Terrifying. Uh, I, I think she probably asked around about Temple of Doom and was like, no, absolutely not. Especially knowing that it, it was making such a, yeah. a fervor in the, in the summer of 84 mm -hmm. back in the day. So uh, I saw the commercials. I saw the action figures. Some of my strongest mm -hmm. youth memories of Indiana Jones is Around that time, and I want to say like, you know, 82, 83, before the Return of the Jedi figures uh, make it onto the shelves. This mm -hmm. is the era that I always joke about of being the, the sad Lobot era where almost mm -hmm. every other Empire figure, there hasn't been new figures in a while and everybody's gone except for there's a bunch of sad Lobots. And uh, right next to sad Lobot would be uh, the Cairo Swordsman and Toad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Toad, poor Toad. I probably would have actually just bought Indiana Jones and pretended it's it's Han Solo in disguise. <laughs> yeah, probably, right. or or even just like I get, I guess I I know he runs away from a big rock. I'll recreate yeah. that, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it was just like is this is a, a, a mean guy in a business suit. Like the tote just looks like the kind of guy that my dad sells printing to. I, I don't know, you know. Um, yeah. By the way, I blurted out poor tote. I, I'm not sympathetic <laughs> to him or the Nazi cause there. I just want to be clear about that. But the figure itself sitting there with a little bit. Yep, just sad low button in in sad tote. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think I think it, it had a big build up in my mind because you know what about it was even scarier than you know uh, things in Gremlins or Ghostbusters because I did see Gremlins, mm -hmm. um, and so I really really wanted to see it. And uh, my my parents were just it, it, were weird about adopting things, adopting technology. They, they didn't have anything against VCRs. It wasn't like they thought they're against our beliefs, you know? <laughs> yeah. It was just like, do we need one of those? Um, we rented one every once in a while and my brother got fed up, got a job at Dairy Queen to buy a <laughs> VCR. <laughs> I need that to be a Stranger Things plot. That's subplot. That's amazing. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Imagine if the, if the stranger kids things, you know, mm -hmm. didn't have access to some of these films anyway. Uh, so then I, I think it was, uh, probably around like 89 when last crusade was gonna come out and we rented, uh, Raiders, we rented temple of doom. Uh, I can't remember why, but I wasn't able to go to the movie theater, but my, my brother and my dad went to last crusade alone and, and kind of came back <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Like something had happened. Like, I don't, you know, when I saw the film later, I was like, oh, interesting, huh? Um, but I loved them. Uh, you know, when I finally got to see them, I was older, but mm. in a way that gave me a different perspective because I, I wasn't like super analytical, but a little bit more analytical of like, oh, wow, this is like Star Wars meets James Bond. And right. I didn't even know that, you know, famous story of, of mm. Lucas and Spielberg, you know, on vacation, Spielberg saying, I want to do a James Bond and George Lucas going, I got something even better than James Bond, but close enough. Um, I just was a big James Bond fan. And to see this, uh, this story that, that had like, uh, the pulp in the, the mm -hmm. sense of adventure and the kind of old time movie, 1940s film bickering romance and the yeah. splash of the supernatural that all felt like Star Wars to me. Uh, but here was Indiana Jones, this, you know, charming, dashing guy who is who is good with the ladies and a gun and, and a bullwhip and a book. So it was <laughs> like James Bond, but even more, you know. Yeah. Did you feel ever, you know, not that Indy was less than, but your relationship with Star Wars is, is strong and go the Star Trek, like you mentioned, uh, all the other things that you've loved. Um, was it just like something that was off in the distance? Were other kids on the playground playground talking about it? Because I don't remember having a lot of Indiana Jones playground conversations. 
I think I think they did, but I think it was in a in a large stew of things that I hadn't seen. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it. Uh, I think my relationship with Indiana Jones is is similar to like um, Friday the Thirteenth or Nightmare on Elm Street or Porky's. <laughs> 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 All these films that had something you know m- m- too adult, too yeah. scary, too enthralling. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, I think uh, we, we can't talk about pop culture, apparently, without uh, doing some self-counseling, I think, uh, mm-hmm. contributed to some feelings of, of being left out, you know, yeah. and not wanting to be left out. And, and I loved Indiana Jones. And we'll, we'll talk about the television show. But, you know, I, I saw the films pretty close to when the television show came on and I was all in on the television show. But I think because I came to the films a little bit later than a lot of the same people our, our age. I think I sometimes have that, like, is somebody going to try to fake geek me on Indiana Jones? Mm. Cause, cause it, it didn't fully enter my world when I was, you know, eight. Uh, I think I, I have that anxiety sometimes, uh, even though I was quite young when I discovered it and, and very into it. Well, this is truly a perilous podcast for us both here as we're diving into <laughs> something we both love, but uh, I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Cause again, again, I go going through my memory. Star Wars is, such a powerful phenomenon in pop culture, not just for what's on screen, but the, the figures, the merch, the world created around, the fandom that springs up. It's not that Star Trek doesn't have passionate fans or Doctor Who, something you love, but indie, passionate fans, but the figures never quite clicked. Uh, it mm-hmm. wasn't something that we went on the playground and, all right, today you're going to be Marion and I'll be indie. And we didn't, you know, it was different than your Leia, I'm Han, or your Luke, or this. It, we just didn't do that. So it was a different vibe. So it was always, never, again, never less than, but it was just, Almost for me as a kid, this adult thing, you talk about, Mm -hmm. hey, you know, your old brother, but like it was almost over there and like, hey, 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 you know about Indy, right? Like it was weird. It wasn't quite behind the curtain at the movie shop, (laughs) but (laughs) it it is, it is in some ways, you know, it's amazing that it is tied to the story of why we have PG-13 because it existed in, in in this nebulous PG-13. It's not quite like there's full nudity, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it isn't zapped with Scott Bale, but it's a little behind a curtain, mm-hmm. at least at least for for my experience. Yeah, no, I, look, I'm a kid who picked up the Porky's box, so it was like, "Mom, can you watch this?" Because Porky the pig, right? Like, <laughs> I haven't had that exchange. So, yeah, I do want to see the special edition of Porky's that is actually the story of, of Porky Pig. Uh, yeah, and the action figure story is is fascinating. That to watch the movie Indiana Jones, right? Uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, in particular, it's in my opinion just as thrilling as Star Wars. Yeah. But then when you break it down to figures and you imagine like, OK, well, uh, here, here's a figure of kind of like a, a hench person for Star Wars mm-hmm. is Bosk, weird lizard guy with the space rifle in a mm-hmm. space suit. And here's the cool uh, hench person for uh, in, Indiana Jones and Raiders Lost Ark. It's German mechanic, <laughs> <laughs> a bald guy uh, with no shirt and a wrench. Yeah. Just as exciting, far more exciting than yeah. Bosk, frankly, in terms of action scenes uh, yeah. in the film. More exciting than Boba Fett in terms of the actual action you see on the screen. But in terms of the imagination of, do you want to take German mechanic home and make up adventures? Not quite as exciting. <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, we never did get a Jack Porkins in the original Kenner run. But if we got the <laughs> William Hookins character of government agent coming to compensate evidence, like, it, just, it wouldn't be the same. Would be sad. Yeah, I don't think I would have been super jazzed to get the, the, the German mechanic figure as a kid. No, mm-hmm. no, I really want him. I don't know how expensive he is. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, but what, what, well, there's one bit of merch merch out there. I, I I can't remember the details of it again. Foggy stuff, but I think that did fuel my my imagination for wanting more indie. After having having seen Raiders, there was many miniatures, not quite the same. Kenner Star Wars miniatures that were released mm. and I do love, but there was like a miniature and it might have been the same. Someone, a toy expert could, could tell me. And I remember looking at the series catalog and wanting them because they had the whole like uh, archaeology, ar- the, the chase at the archaeological dig mm. and they had horses, they had little tiny horses and all the stuff. And, and I remember wanting that and just staring at that in the series catalog, the old wish book aptly named and just dreaming of that sequence and wanting to control it with my figures like tell the story in it that's the only bit of of indie merch that stood out to me as a kid that's fascinating yeah that's such a and that makes sense because it's it's the scene right Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and so it captures all the all the the majesty of it you know there's just this power in in star wars and in he-man he-man was you know reverse engineered 
to- toys first. And then in order to sell the toys, like, sure, yeah, we got a show. Yeah, we'll make one. Yeah. Um, so so there's so many popular toys at the time that are like, even if you haven't seen what they're from yet, you're intrigued by them. Mm-hmm. And Indiana Jones is this weird opposite where it's almost like, hey, every time that Indiana Jones rides a horse, that's really exciting. But to just have, which they did mm-hmm. <laughs> on the shelf, here's a horse. Yeah. <laughs> Trust yeah. that it's exciting. Yeah. Doesn't mm-hmm. quite work the same way. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we can get into Toy Center uh, later. Uh, my obsessions are showing. But I want to get into uh, our relationship with the Indiana Jones uh, as adults. Uh, mm-hmm. What is, now, now that you're an adult, now that you've watched the movies many times, you've uh, thought about them, I'm sure you've had thousands of uh, bar discussions about which ones are good. You... Uh, you and I and everyone of a certain age uh, fought in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull Wars of mm-hmm. 2008. Uh, now, why do you love them? What is the appeal? I, I think because it is realistic in a way, right? It's our world. I think I was drawn to that as you get older. There's there's definitely, you know, hero worship. I always say there's no difference between me wanting to be Indiana Jones and wanting to be the starting catcher for the New York Yankees. They were both mm-hmm. dreams I had. And both just as impossible, it turned out. Um, But I could try, right? I could try. And there was something so real about Indy and so endearing. We'll get into some of the details of that. But I I think it's very important that Indy is sometimes one step behind and then three steps ahead and then slips and falls or doesn't (laughs) quite know or is trying to do good. There's these kind of things that over over the years, I think... It's tough to say I look up to to any character, right? Especially mm-hmm. I love Han and I love Indy, and I I, I definitely think they're flawed, and and, and, I don't, and that's a good thing for me. You can learn from that, but um, I think there's that experience, and and this was uh, it was interesting to watch when some of the initial recasting of Indy rumors came about. Um, Chris Pratt, a name that had popped up, right? And every once in a while, you'll still see that. And Harrison says, oh, only I'm going to play him. But that's not even, ever been true, uh, you know, since the TV show. Uh, actually, since Last Crusade. But I, it was an interesting phenomenon to watch our generation deal with that. And one of my friends, uh, Michael Beatrice, had, had written an article on, on the old Schmozno website about the reason we are having a problem with that is 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 we're all aging out. We're now getting older than our dreams of being indie. <laughs> And we can't. So it's Harrison still older than us. And so we're connected to the dream still alive. I can be 75 wishing I, I'm a 79 year old indie now. I get, you know, like it, it's, it's still there. And so I think along the, there's just such a realistic part of indie that, that draws the end that I could still go have some kind of adventure. Uh, I could still, um, you know, go find something in the, in the jungle and, and try to preserve it or, or, or fight bad guys or just, uh, you know, run around, uh, you know, Paris and, 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 uh, other other wonderful historical locations that I can still dream about. I know it's not real. I'm never going to do that. I barely like walking around my neighborhoods anymore. Like, like <laughs> it's not, but it's, as I got older, I think I appreciate that aspect of Indy, the, the flawed hero. The flawed hero. So you see yourself in him, but he's also doing impossible, fantastic things that, that you don't necessarily get to do. Yeah. Right. Like I'd love to swing from a, a rope on my own whip or something across the castle walls i no way i'd fall no <laughs> way. yeah imagine you know indiana jones being like can you put a net under this then i'll swing yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um you have said in the past that indiana jones is your favorite f- fictional character yeah. is it because of that is it because it's the the mix of he is both relatable you can mm-hmm. see yourself in him and he is also someone to aspire to in that he does the the fantastic and the impossible or is there something more specific about the character of Indiana Jones that, that makes you say that? I, I think because in, in comparing it to Star Wars and, and Han Solo, Han Solo, even at the end of the day, is part of a larger ensemble. He's part of a larger saga. And you could spend some time with Han, but I go to Star Wars for a lot of other reasons than just that Han's my favorite character. Indy, it is all about him, for better or worse. It's his story. It's his tale. There's things going on around him. All the realistic stuff I talked about. And I just... I've always uh, engaged with Indiana Jones, the franchise different than I have with Star Wars, even during the heyday of, of, of pop culture, you know, eighties and all that stuff. It, it was just a, just go on this adventure with this character type of thing. And he's, he's very funny. And again, we're, we're going to talk about some of the, the dividing lines between the characters and Harrison and, and, and they're, and they're thin, <laughs> they're thin. Um, <laughs> What a wisecrack, uh, you know, for me, who uh, is a straight white kid in the suburbs who, who did not quite have all the attention of the girls he wanted. 
Indy had it. And, you know, that does go a long way for a kid like me. And, the, and, and, and so there's just, he's the total package in a lot of ways. He looks cool. I, I, I have an Indiana Jones hat. I do not look cool in it, but I try, <laughs> uh, you know, there's somebody, I, I, I don't look good in those kind of khakis either. Like, but I, I would try, like, it's just, it's just that it's just, when I think of Indy, I think of fun. I think of adventure. I literally think of the posters. I think of the fun. I think of the music that's all present in Star Wars. It's present in other things, but it hits me in a different way. It's more direct. It's Indiana Jones. And I want to go on an adventure with him. And that's why I absolutely love uh, the character in that way. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I, I think, you know, you're speaking to something right at the end there with the the music. Uh, uh, that's mm -hmm. such a power yeah. of of these films, of this, uh, you know, entire idea of that. The beginning of that main theme is so stirring that the beginning of that is almost like somebody throwing a door open and going like, you want to do something cool? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and then the music explodes and becomes something cool. And it really is the, this invitation to adventure. Yeah. Uh, and, and like you're saying, you get to go on an adventure that is both relatable and totally not relatable. Um, yeah. We talk about that a lot in, in Star Wars and in my love of genre. Of I like to see bizarre, fantastic, you know, places, events, things, creatures that are not real and, and maybe physically could never even be real. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But still see something familiar in them. And I think that for me is the big appeal of the Indiana Jones movies and the character in particular. Um, I think what I love most about him is the combination of, uh, to, to put it in a weird term, swagger and books. Um, yeah. I don't know that I would love him or the series as much if he wasn't also, if we didn't get to also see him in his day to day as a teacher in a suit, you know? <laughs> um, yes. And there's there's so much to that. There, it, it evokes a little bit of the superhero secret identity thing. Um, it yeah. evokes on screen a truth about James Bond that is definitely in, in, in books uh, of all kinds, Ian Fleming in particular, the original ones, and, and sometimes in the movies where you get to see a little bit of this day-to-day -day human who is called to do these you know thrilling but deadly things mm. um you don't always see that in in the film so james bond is some sometimes somebody that you that you know there's the famous old quote which is dated and, and over <laughs> over gendered mm. but the appeal being you know every man wants to be him and every uh, woman mm. wants to be with him uh, not mm. super advocating for that phrase but i think it is articulating mm -hmm. um why some people are pulled toward James Bond and mm -hmm. Indiana Jones definitely has some of that. Like, yeah. you know, when he's in full adventure, you know, a uh, shirt ripped off <laughs> yeah, muscles glistening in the sun, a uh, bull whipping him is himself from truck to truck. I'm like, I've never been like, yeah, that's me, you know? Yeah. Right. But yeah. there's this element where we, where we immediately see the human side of him that makes it possible to imagine yourself in his situation a little bit. It's a, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a, it's a giant thing. I it, And again, this is where the, the wonderful vagueness sleeps in. I don't remember that much of it in, in Temple of Doom. Right. In fact, it's quite the opposite. He starts as James Bond in that film and, and then goes to the adventures. It's a different vibe for me. Raiders. And when I remember seeing Raiders, I was fascinated and confused that he was a teacher, <laughs> like had a teaching job. He was a professor. I, I, I didn't understand it. I had to have that explained to me. I remember talking to my dad about that, not the details of it. But I just, I remembered like it was a big record scratch. Mm -hmm. And then once I, I was able to understand what that was, you're absolutely right. If you're sitting in class daydreaming, <laughs> your connection to Indy is going to be a lot, a lot stronger than even Han and the Imperial Flight Academy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it's going to yeah. be different. And I absolutely agree that there's, there's a lot of wonderful things he said in there, but I, I, that tripped me up and then built me up as a, as an indie fan. Yeah, that makes that the trip you up and built you up make, makes a lot of sense. And I've never really thought about it that way. And, and the power scene Temple of Doom first that you don't get to see uh, every day Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. I, I think what I really love about every day Indiana Jones is he's still amazing. Right. Um, we get the the famous, you know, uh, love you written on the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the mm -hmm. eyelids. Yeah. Right. It's not like it's not like some w weird, uh, you know, uh, 
nutty professor where he's right. a, a super swinger or a, or a devastating, you know, mm-hmm. unwanted nobody, right? Yeah. But what he is, in my opinion, is a huge nerd, right? Mm-hmm. It motivates so much of the character. It, we've talked about so much with uh, Luke Skywalker not being ripped with muscles, throwing down the blade, being being a different vision in in the 80s than a lot of the... I am loaded with muscles and guns and I alone will <laughs> drop in and fight an entire nation or civilization. Yeah. Um, he, Indiana Jones is also different because he is extremely, uh, you know, competent, fit, muscular, all of these things. Mm-hmm. But we learn very quickly, he's not in it to prove he's a stereotypical man. Right. Uh, everything comes from the books. He learns he wants to know, he wants to protect, he wants to preserve, he wants to set right. Uh, the past matters. Every object has meaning, power, it's sacred, knowledge matters. Everything that animates him is frankly um, uh, academic and nerdy. It's, yeah. I've learned all this stuff, I know all this stuff, it isn't just boring whatever. I didn't want, feel like reading the manual today. Mm-hmm. It's, he's like, he's read the manual, and that's why he cares. So yeah. it creates this scenario where he's a multi-layered character, but it also creates a scenario where adventure is, in, is a necessity. Mm. Mm. I that's don't, great. He, he certainly has moments of like, Maybe he does seem, you know, vitalized by having adventure and, and having romance. And, and there is a little bit of interesting psychology of it. Does he feel a little trapped in the day to day? And he kind of he kind of maybe he craves adventure a little bit. Yeah. But I don't think we feel that on the screen a lot. I think what we feel on the screen is I'm capable of adventure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is. I don't I'm not. I didn't, you know, sign up for a reality television show. I don't want to be dragged behind a truck. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But that is, I have to endure adventure to get to my actual goal, which is all motivated by knowing what the object is and really caring about what happens to it, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It makes the truck chase in the Raiders, in Raiders, which is like one of the greatest action scenes ever, one of the things that makes that the greatest action scene ever is is because it's it's relatable, right? Um, I can't relate to physically being able to do almost anything he does in that. Mm-hmm. But watching this person who goes, I care about this, I got to fix it. This isn't the best idea, and I don't even know how I'm going to get out of it, but I'm going to throw myself into it. Uh, that's how I felt when I bought a house. That's how I mm-hmm. felt, <laughs> you know, uh, when I start a new relationship. That's what I feel, you know, when I try to make a short film of like, there's a bunch along this road that's going to hurt <laughs> and I don't even know what I'm doing, but I got to try. I think that's a huge appeal of Indiana Jones to me. I think you're striking a, a, a powerful chord there with this song that you talk about here. This, this enduring, this, this, it's a call to action. It, it's, uh, I don't have to do this, but I need to do this for the greater good. Right. And and now we're starting to look at some of the themes of it here, but I absolutely think you're right. Him coming back, talking to Marcus Brody, like I almost had it. Like it, you get the sense that he's, for the most part, doing it for the right reasons and stopping those who are doing it for the wrong reasons, perhaps. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, I'm sure, in, the, in this mm-hmm. series. But but I, I I really do think you're right. It's a superhero vibe. I've always just, you know been drawn to Batman in a way where it's just it's always struck me as a little more realistic versus the others. It's just my view growing up with it. But there's a little bit of like I, I'm compelled to do this. Uh, not so much that I want to. And I really think that's it. I really think that because, uh, you know, tying to, you know, Indy, Indy bubbles and stumbles. He doesn't have a plan. You know, all those kind of things that I could I could point at. But I think down below, um, it is what you're saying. He's just a, he's just a normal professor who, sigh, has to go do this thing because <laughs> it's the right thing to do. Yeah. I really feel like that to me is the big picture thing. And it, 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 it'll be really fun as we watch the films and discuss them. You know, what moments do we see where, where he feels like, um, where, you, where you get a glint in his eye that, that he's happy to be out there mm-hmm. <laughs> with the hat in the, in the jacket, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and where are the moments where he's just like, I, I, I would much rather be, you know, at, at a symposium, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, than, than doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think another big appeal to me is, 
you know, this whole big idea of of a uh, relatable but fantastic world, you know, mm-hmm. we get to go somewhere that, you know, uh, a lot of us, you know, have, have never been. It, it is set in the real world, but it's a fictionalized version of the real world. It taps mm-hmm. into, you know, some amount of real history, much of it, you know, debated or or inaccurate, uh, which we will discuss those, you know, um, controversial parts mm-hmm. of the Indiana Jones series. Um, but it is that spirit of going somewhere really interesting, really intriguing, going somewhere you maybe couldn't go, uh, but still recognizing every emotion that that's happening mm. there. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Final thing for me that I, that I want to kind of mention in, in the big picture, and we'll get into it, I'm sure, more as we talk about its relationship to Star Wars. But the fact that it is this serial adventure that just that always appealed to me, I think, the the wanting to replicate the thrill of, you know, seeing a, a Saturday, you know, afternoon serial uh, or seeing them rebroadcast on television and knowing that your hero is going to get into trouble. But what was it going to be and how is it going to escalate and how are they going to get out of it? And then trying to cram that, you know, <laughs> into a two hour movie and having this this devotion to set pieces and escalation. I think that structure is what what lets us feel so uh that india is so relatable because how many of us have a day where it's i i think i'm on top of the problem i have mm-hmm. nope actually it turns out that one problem is three problems uh i tried to fix it and i made it six problems <laughs> yeah. you know there's a yeah. huge appeal of that that comes from the serial adventure structure uh absolutely and and i, I think it's the star wars thing of it all as well but i just love returning to it was fascinated by by the time last crusade comes around um learning the Temple of Doom was technically a prequel, right? That blew my mind of, oh, look, then, think of then think of the other adventures he's had. <laughs> think of it all. I mean, to go back and experience that uh, time and time again. I, I just, I remember loving that in 89. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do, do you think you enjoy the aspect of it that is trying to, it's, it's an adventure story. It's an action adventure story. Uh, but I've been really on this kick lately mm-hmm. uh, of talking about the history of entertainment Mm-hmm. Being interested in American entertainment, in, in particular coming out of you know vaudeville, and that idea that a little bit of everything is great. So Indiana Jones is is an action adventure exploration movie first, but it's got comedy. It's mm-hmm. always got romance. It's got heart. It has some, uh, in my opinion, deeper thoughts about mm-hmm. history and and what what do objects mean and respect for cultures and all, all sorts of meaty interesting even controversial stuff do you think that is a part of what appealed to you that this sense that that a story should have a little of everything absolutely when i set out on my own screenwriting journey uh, studying in college and, and one of the reasons I moved to la it didn't uh, my, my life just didn't go that direction as completely as I thought it would uh, which is okay but i i i, I craved that and everything i was writing all not even just all quadrants in that old corporate studio speak, but like just, yeah, that it's got everything. I, I never just wanted to write comedy. I wanted a little bit of drama and thought and and uh, spirituality showed up a lot in my writing. Uh, I need a comedy, you know, romance when done right. It's, it's so fun. And yeah, I absolutely think, because it because Star Wars, especially the original trilogy, of course has that. Uh, absolutely has that. And I wrote Space Adventures. <laughs> you know, that <laughs> never, will, never will see the light of the day. Um, but it, it, it was indie, and 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 the first thing I tried to ever shoot with my friends, and never got close, was an adventure serial type of thing. Mm. Greatly influenced by it, because I think you could do all those things. It's hard for me, and I, I think you're you're probably in the same spot. A lot of people in our line of work are where I don't want to just do one thing. I sometimes want to have a podcast where I get really deep. I get really um, open about things I struggle with on my personal podcast, but I also do silly comedy things. I think words matter, but my stand up routine goes from adventure to, uh, you know, uh, bad jokes uh, about stomach problems to, you know, <laughs> hopefully the profound and, and hopefully make you uh, think about things. And and I, I, I absolutely think that's part of the appeal for Mindy. And it's not something at eight. I went, you know what? That struck a lot of different chords. Of course not, but that's the genius of it. And I look for that in a lot of my favorite pieces of media, especially movies. Yeah, I I think that it has, I think it used to be so much more standard that, you know, for a big movie for kind of all ages, and it turns out that PG-13 is the age, Mm -hmm. um, that you want to have a little bit 
of everything. And then I think there there was kind of a, a push. Um, I think it, it partially it's the sort of the Hollywood mindset changing to we want things really branded. You know, mm-hmm. this is a horror movie or this is a comedy movie. Leave your brain at home. It's just a comedy movie. Right. Uh, you know, and I experienced that, you know, especially when I first came uh, mm-hmm. to Hollywood and, and telling people like, yeah, I'm interested in being a uh, writer, like television movies. Okay, well, television. Oh, okay, tell what kind of television? Probably comedy, uh, single camera, multi camera, like <laughs> just this yeah. this yeah. desire, this need to break everything down, 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 down. Mm-hmm. And and uh, we, we won't get into MCU Center, but I think that is a part of what the initial appeal of MCU was. It had this really easy branding label of their superhero movies. But if you break them down, what's going on is they have a little bit of everything. They have action, but the characters are real. Uh, They have uh, actual problems that reflect real world problems. They have romance. They have comedy. Mm -hmm. They have, they pull from different genres. The MCU is to me uh, a part of the, the heritage of vaudeville, strangely, Mm -hmm. in in a time where we're not getting as many stories that have that mission statement to have a little bit of everything. This is fascinating. We could do Vaudeville Center in another way or just Comedy Influence Center. I, You and I both came up of age in the end of the variety show era. Um, and I've always said one of the things, one of the greatest influences in my professional career, podcasting and otherwise, a comedy is The Muppet Show, which is literally a variety show behind the scenes of a variety <laughs> show and, and Vaudeville on stage and music and this thing. And I, 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 think, I think I look at that. I, this is why sometimes... I pull out of, I used to be invested in movies more um, as a film school student, that type of vibe. I used to have my Oscar checklist and go to Oscar parties. Left that a long time ago. One of it is I just found myself appreciating the wonderful pieces of art that I was watching with everyone. But man, I did not have fun. <laughs> man, I did not <laughs> laugh. And this is why straight dramas are so valuable. But I've never, I never get pulled in. And, and uh, I, I really, th- I maybe even haven't stopped to think about it to this level until you mentioned that of what indie is that's the full experience for me that i love yeah it's a it's a Mm. full meal and it'll be fun to to think about as we go along uh we're going to get into some more details but i also want to have this this really important big picture question of do you at this point we're not we're not going to (laughs) rank but do you have films in the franchise that you like better personally that you are more drawn to and and if so why Always put on Last Crusade. If I'm in the mood, I need a little indie in my life. I'm going to put it on the whether it's in the background or we're going to sit down. Always go Last Crusade first. Uh, the answer, yeah, you're, you're right, not ranking, but the answer, uh, it, it's akin to Return of the Jedi. Kind of uh, is my favorite the original trilogy because of what it did for me. But Empire's the better one. You know, it's like you put on your snooty. <laughs> Critic glasses and go, but Empire's a better one. And I, I think I appreciate Empire more and more every time. And I would call it probably my favorite. But that doesn't, it's it's like you and I talk, the sequel, uh, yeah, Last Jedi, man, God, that did some stuff to me. But I, you know, I want to watch Rise of Skywalker today, man. <laughs> Last Crusade is, is wonderfully deep. I think there's some powerful stuff in that one that I, I took into my own spirituality, my own life. Absolutely is some big lessons in that, but it's also so damn fun and it's bright, literally bright. When I think of Last Crusade, I think of Sean Connery on the beach with an umbrella. I think of bright <laughs> blue clouds. I think of the sand uh, reflecting the light of the sun and Raiders has that too. And Raiders is one of those, you know, I've had these conversations bar. It is one of the perfect films. It's perfect in so many ways to me. I, I, I'm in there for those conversations, right? Whether they're completely right or wrong, I don't know, but, but Raiders is there, but I go to Last Crusade all the time yeah and obviously we will discuss kingdom of the crystal skull you know Mm -hmm. when we discuss kingdom of the crystal skull but i don't want to leave it out of the the discussion um where do you what's your general reaction to it now where do you sit with it currently i just recently rewatched it grace and i really did to sit down and and before we even knew we're gonna do the series because i hadn't seen it since it was in the theaters wow and that's what 2008 you said yeah 2008 Mm -hmm. and i've said this for four center but now is the time to really put this officially in record. Saw it, saw it with, um, uh, I think, former girlfriend and her brothers and everything. We, we came out of the theater, Cinerama Dome hmm. at Arclight. Came out and I was like, yeah, great. And literally them and everyone else around me, MySpace, early Facebook days, whatever, whatever. Everyone else were friends. I was hanging out with, the you know, Schmoes was just launching. I wasn't involved with it, but they were doing, Mark and Christian were doing their video reviews. 
so that world was being opened up to me. And, and, and everyone was like, oh, no, we didn't like that. But not in the way of our personal opinion is we didn't like that. It was like, no, no, we, the royal we, capital W, we don't like that. <laughs> and that's not, a, that's a, maybe a general sweep. And maybe you're out there listening, go, no, I liked it. Well, I didn't know you. And I couldn't find you on Twitter. And I, I shut down. And there's, again, there's some things in it. Hey, Grace and I rewatching it. Uh, we'll do the deeper dive. Yeah, there's some things that look a little off. There's some choices that they made. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder how into it Spielberg was. I don't know him. And I'm having a conversation with Steve. <laughs> Won't. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes it's like, it, it, it was also a different era. I've talked about this too. 08, Iron Man, all those, James Bond, Daniel Craig, all this stuff. It was, it was, it was the first big rush of we're going to go back to things. Mm. You know, not kind of prequels is different, but now a reboot, a, a requel, all those kind of things, all those kind of terms, and they're big business, and and in large part because of stuff that started around that era. But I'm looking forward to Indy Five because it's a perfect time to do it. I think, mm-hmm. and and but four was the fir- one of the fir- first big gaps gasps of it's back. Oh, that wasn't. I don't know. What are we doing here? And 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 it's you know it's more of a film f- cinephile discussion to have. But I, I, it was a different different era in, in big tentpole filmmaking, and I, I just remember thinking they hit they hit a lot of the notes. It, it, they didn't hit all of them, but what fun! And man, just being going okay, got it, and never watched it until two thousand twenty two. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, uh, I think that I in in I remember enjoying it, but also feeling like almost like uh, almost. Almost ten years have passed since the uh, the prequel wars, <laughs> yes. since the beginning of them in the Phantom Menace. And I was just like, uh, I don't need to do this again. <laughs> yes. uh, mm-hmm. I enjoyed it, but everybody around me has their 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 official list of here is why it is bad. Period. You know, right? Um, and and my wife and I had had done a, a big build up to seeing it. We were excited because my wife had watched Indiana Jones as a kid and, and enjoyed it. So we we bought the DVDs. We watched every behind the scenes bonus feature and, and we were pumped up for it. And I think we both really enjoyed it. And then there was just the like, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, from mm-hmm. from everyone around us. And like Ken says, maybe you were there in 2008 and you walked out and you and everybody you knew loved it. But uh, that was not the experience I had. No, no, we're gonna go into the the details of that obviously in a couple episodes from now. But but there's so many. I, the part of it was I love what you're, you're describing of uh, we. I just finished fighting in those prequel wars or, or the fights just begun. Uh, but there's along the way, especially about 2010 to 12, when I was really starting to get to the digital media movie discussion world. I, I it's so easy, a lot easier to be snarky back then, and I was snarky at times, and so I think I just kind of followed that path a little bit, unfortunately, but. I do remember even vocalizing, but getting a lot of pushback on there's, there's the problems you're all saying that are there in Crystal Skull to me, aren't problems. They're extensions of what Indy's always done mm-hmm. that I'm sorry, that fridge scene to me is not any more crazy than jumping out of a plane in, a, in an inflatable raft. No. Uh, it's, it's bigger and, and it, it's maybe sillier because you, you know, it's of the air or something. Sure. It doesn't have to be your favorite, but I just remember like, it, wow, you're, you're really, there's something there's something you're, you're holding up the old ones to a standard that you're not, you're not, you're not allowing the, the, the new one to be covered under it. I, I just remember having a problem with that. There's other things we can talk about. That I don't think work as well. Uh, looks and feels CGI. So that's, that's a discussion, but I remember just remember ever, everyone, what everyone was poking at, I was like, yeah, I think you're overlooking a lot of things and it's not fair. <laughs> yeah. I remember a big buildup that, that is, that has some similarity, honestly, to the force awakens of, mm-hmm interviews with Spielberg being like, oh, yeah. this is amazing to go back and try to remember how did we make movies back then? What technology did we use? And we're really going to do that. So I remember bumping against like, I didn't think the CGI looked bad or anything, but like mm-hmm. I, I was expecting this science experiment of like, <laughs> we did not use any equipment <laughs> that yeah. had been created post 1990. And yeah, and there's some CGI for me. That's like, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it, but it does look different and, yeah. and feel different. And I think I bumped, that was one of those things where Oh, this isn't about the actual film. This is about the relationship between the interviews in the film. Yes. And when oh. you remove the mm. interviews and mm-hmm. the expectations built up by them, yeah. Uh, we we just last year we watched uh, all the films. We just watched Raiders one night cuz like what we feel like watching a really damn good movie. Let's yeah. just watch Raiders. And then my wife was like, "We need to watch the next one tomorrow." I'm like, "Okay." So we watched all four of them. And it really did feel to me like just letting go all of the 
baggage of you know what was expected how deep of a you know ding cinema sin is nuking the fridge <laughs> like yeah letting go of all of it it's just like i i feel like if actual aliens came yeah they they would say like i ah i see these are four movies they're all of a series they they would not have any of the extra like what is this fourth dangling abomination on this <laughs> perfect trilogy it, it it so felt like these four movies are all connected they're all the same yeah, I, I'm with you. I can't wait to discuss it in more detail. And, and, and it is slightly different than the prequel conversation or pri- slight, slightly different than the prequel generation emerging and, and having a stronger voice in, in the landscape. I think you might find some of that. But I, I, I do think some of the stuff you're saying, it was one of the first examples of, and I didn't realize it then. I wasn't talking about things like I, I do now back then, even in 08. But it was like first time I was like, I don't know if you are you are talking about what you're, the movie's saying or what you're seeing. You're talking about what you feel um, you want to, be part of the, the snark, the conversation, the, 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 you know, the fridge scene. We, you, you, you talk to, you don't have, again, you don't have, listening to us now. You don't have to like the fridge scene, but if you yeah. start, if I bring up crystal skull and you go, Oh, fridge scene, I know we're not having, going to have a good discussion about the film. I just know we're not. Yeah. Sorry. We're not, <laughs> we're not. Yeah. I will. I'm going to say one more thing about kingdom of the crystal skull and then I'm going to move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I feel like is always it, it, we always say with with uh, Star Wars and also Indiana Jones whatever your favorite is that's just fine if if you don't like something if you have reasons that w- we have the utmost respect for other people's uh, uh, opinions and and even analysis we might disagree with the analysis and all that so I want to say this with with all those caveats I find like there can be this response where you know you you have a legitimate criticism or dislike of say the line somehow Palpatine returned and mm-hmm. the fact mm-hmm. that it really bumped for you that you, that they didn't fully explain or clarify how he, how he could live and, and you're out and that's it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it, it, to me, there's a difference between not liking it, uh, critiquing it and being like that there's this wound at early in the film and therefore you just cannot engage with anything else in the film. Right. It, right. it, it, it broke early for you and now it's done. And mm-hmm. I feel like there's a similar relationship with the fridge of like, totally. And and that's part of what I was what I was moved by. It's like, wow, there's a lot going on in Kingdom mm-hmm. of the Crystal Skull. It it really plays with the anxieties of the actual 1950s and how they manifested in the pulp storytelling of the time. And now here's this pulp storytelling in 2008, mm-hmm. poking at all of those deep and important issues, which we'll get into when we discuss mm-hmm. it. Um, Mm -hmm. and I had that same kind of reaction of like, I understand bumping on, on escaping a, a nuclear bomb with a fridge. I get that. I really get that. But uh, there's that part of me that wants to say like, okay, can, what would happen if you accepted that and then really engaged with the rest of the film? Would you find something there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, a preview of our (laughs) kingdom of the crystal skull. Impassioned. Yeah. Yeah. To answer my own question about uh, personal favorites, it, this is where it draws close to Star Wars to me. Of mm-hmm. Raiders, I think is is perfection. It is an amazing, amazing film. Um, I think Last Crusade has a ton of heart and, and kind of goes deeper in some way. You, you've said some really wonderful things about it. Uh, I think Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is is fascinating because it's dealing with some different ideas and dealing with the the uh what was going on if, if we've tapped out of indy's life for 20 years what was going on in the real world and what was and how was it being dealt with in our popular fiction of the time um but from from the guy who 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 brings you attack of the clones is one of my favorites because it's beautiful and also not perfect and kind of weird <laughs> the one i sit and think about is temple of doom it is not in my opinion the the best movie mm-hmm. it's full of weirdness it's um mm-hmm. it's messy it's extremely pulpy it's terrifying um like a literal scene in temple of doom watching it feels like it's always just about to fall off the rails but then it does something kind of cool you know yeah. yeah uh and i i think i think there's i think i'm really just i'm not arguing that it is the best in any way shape or form mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. so much to discuss with it but I think sometimes when we say uh, uh, pulp, um, it, it it's slightly um, pulp that's been made safer. Actual pulp was using sexuality 
and mm-hmm. fear and the unknown to make you lean in and go, what's going on? I want to know. Yeah. And Temple of Doom, rather than like just using a pulpy title, it it leans into actual terrifying darkness mm-hmm. in a way that not everything that that invokes pulp does. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I can't wait to discuss this film. Um, I've seen of, of the original three, and that's not a statement on, on Crystal Skull, everybody, but I've, I've run into those people who don't acknowledge the existence of four. Um, <laughs> of the original three, I, I, I'm not joking when I say, I think I've seen Temple of Doom less than 15 times in my life. Wow. Where I think Raiders and Lost Crusade, have, it's in the 40s. You know, I've lost count, right? Uh, wow. Which is not a, it, it, it uh, but when I say that, when I just have a quick flash of Indiana Jones, you see Indiana Jones, at least four to five sequences from Temple pop into my head, right? Right. It's quintessential Indiana Jones. So that's why I can't turn away from the film. It's not as me making a statement on it. It's the least of my favorite films. I just, I just don't get, I, 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 I it, by the way, could very well be that still have some trauma from being terrified in the movie theater. <laughs> Let's be honest. Uh, I still kind of turn away when large Marge pops on the screen with Pee Wee. So uh, that's, probably something to do with it but beyond that like and and, and but that to me I'm, I'm saying that in hopes to um support your your interest in claiming that film because it is all the things you described but it's all these the openings club obi-wan is amazing mm-hmm. uh the, the the cart chase scene with the water i, I remember being in the theater has been blown oh my gosh the water oh my god get out of here their feet are hot oh my that was one of my favorite things in all the film <laughs> when indy tries to stop the cart and his feet are hot 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 water water uh and, and then the bridge scene like there's so many things that oh. is loving that and and that's also that goes to some of the Attack of the Clones conversation, of yeah. For a long time, I'd say that's ah, probably my least ranked Star Wars film. But man, those seismic charges! Oh man, this that! Oh, I love the opening sequence! Oh God, I love that music! That's what we're here for. And Temple is full of quintessential Indiana Jones. Oh, extremely well said. The first uh, well said of uh, Indiana Jones and the Perilous Podcast. Yeah, I, I feel the same way about uh, Attack of the Clones in in Temple of Doom. Of there's so much of it that for me just like. Uh, what are you talking about? That works. That's fire. That's great. That's an amazing scene. That's an amazing mm-hmm. idea. Mm-hmm. And then the parts that are weird or messy or idiosyncratic or, or maybe even kind of controversial are, they are weird, messy, controversial in fascinating ways that make me want to keep looking, not look away. Yeah. Yeah. No, a lot there. Mm. All right. Well, that is really just the beginning of our adventure, Ken, <laughs> on our first episode. And now we're going to go even deeper. There are definitely controversial things in the world of Indiana Jones, and we're definitely here to to celebrate it. But we also want to acknowledge them, right? Uh, there's the age difference with Indy in Marion. There's there's the complex real world history of European and uh, and United States cultures removing other cultures artifacts that's impossible to avoid there's you know historical inaccuracies in in you know real life civilizations um so i I think we can acknowledge those wrestle with those and still love the overall franchise but i but i want to talk about them a little bit starting Mm -hmm. with the big picture both criticism and sometimes fun joke that indiana jones is a terrible archaeologist what part of that to you is an important conversation? Mm. What part of it is a fun joke? How much of it do you think is is true? Where do you go with all that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're 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 uh, racing in a cart dangerously up to that. Uh, you know, if you remove Indiana Jones, it wouldn't affect the plot conversation. I'm sure we're going to get into here. <laughs> that, that'll um, be half of our Raiders episode. Oh, yes, it will. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. I want to start with one of the biggest ones here: the 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 the, the complex history of European cultures removing other cultures' artifacts. That you have down here in Northern. That's such a, that's a it's a very important real world conversation. That's probably been around for a very long time, but longer than I paid attention to, if I'm being mm-hmm. honest, right? So when it started to emerge more and more, I just saw a meme using Marion and Indy just the other day on Twitter to 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 ask this point. Of it belongs in a museum, but the museum of the culture, right? Right? Like doing the Padme Anakin meme. Just mm-hmm. saw with Indy. When this first, I, 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 I'm admitting something. When this conversation first kind of entered into, where it's you see it online, I got defensive of Indy. <laughs> and I'm not saying that's right or that's my position on it. I just remember thinking, you, he's not, you're not telling me Indy's a bad guy, are you? <laughs> like, I, I mean, I'm not lying. I, I, I it, this is how strong you and I talk about pop culture and how you look at pop culture. It's how you look at the world. I, I, it's all intertwined for me. 
it starts there. And it, and it made me think about any, made me think about the movies, made me think of the, of the time the movies are, are made, makes me think of the time the movies are set in. Uh, and, and, and if, if the, one of the positives of having some of these movies made in different eras that maybe yeah, you look at and go, Hey, we'd handle that different, or we'd address something more directly, which by the way, to Indy five, we're going to have a chance to do that. Maybe mm -hmm. we'll see. Um, um, I just think it, it, it just shines. It's, it's important. It's important to have this conversation based on pop culture. So I don't have any definitive answer yet for you there, but I, it, it's, it's amazing to me how intertwined they can be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really agree with that. And I think that's all, always what's hard about these conversations when somebody has a legitimate criticism saying these films, they might be made for fun, but they have because of their popularity and how much we love them, they have a massive impact. So let's mm -hmm. let's look critically at what they're saying and what they're not saying. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, it is an important conversation. And I. I start with the most important part, which is in, in my opinion, in the real world, artifacts should absolutely be returned to the culture they're from. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, you know, you just separated out from, from Indiana Jones and it, it's about the real world. Like, yes, if a culture is saying, hey, uh, you have that in your mu museum and we want it back. It's not fighters keepers. It's ours. It's our history. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, you, you should give it back. Yeah. Um, I think that there is there are moments in indiana jones where that criticism what, what you're be des describing in the meme is is absolutely valid i mean it's mm -hmm. he is an archaeologist who goes to you know uh, really interesting places and and from a eurocentric perspective you know we can call them wow fantastic and like but from mm -hmm. a real world perspective like yeah people live there and that's not fantastic to them it's it's their yeah it's their land, it's their life, it's their culture. Mm -hmm. um, so you're already dealing with like, you got to find the balance of that, that there's that truth of no matter where you live, that is your home and it's not exotic to you and other places are. And mm -hmm. just being careful with that filter. Uh, Raiders does start with him going into another culture and, and you know, trying to take something. Uh, Raiders does end with the, you know, United States government. <laughs> Yeah. hoarding and hiding objects. So I think there is plenty to be discussed about that big, larger world issue. So mm -hmm. that's my first step. But then my second step here is not just running with that as a meme, not just running with that as a headline, absolutely respecting it and, and drilling down. Mm -hmm. But then there's that part of it to me of... um I understand how the films and their popularity can maybe reinforce some negative things. Yeah. But, but when I look at the actual films, it, it's a more nuanced conversation. Um, it belongs in a museum is the, is the phrase that always gets used in these conversations. Right. Yep. Um, but that's from a, a specific moment in a specific film where he's talking about a specific artifact that's already been removed from its home place. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, which again, I like, I don't want this to, to be like, I, I um, Indiana Jones apologist or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just think that there's a really interesting discussion to be had, even taking any value out of it of, of what's the intention of the films and then what comes across and what, and what gets perpetrated out into the world. I think if you dig into the actual films and, and look at what Indy's motivations are, I think there's actually an attempt to have a story about a person who does value uh, objects being with th the power of them, the history of them, the knowledge of them, uh, the connection to culture. Um, in Raiders, he's trying to get the artifact before the Nazis do. And, and, the, and the kind of the lesson is we should have left it alone, right? Yeah. Um, in Temple... The entire thing is there's much to be talked about in Temple, which we will uh, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. about cultural issues. But mission wise, he's trying to return the stones um, yeah. in Last Crusade. The, to me, the whole message is, hey, the treasure this time is my dad. <laughs> yeah, I never wanted to go after this. And once again, the lesson is leave it be right. Let it yeah. go. Um, in Kingdom of Crystal Skull, he is returning. Uh, the object. So I think ultimately what I'm saying is big picture. I think there's uh, lots to be discussed, but I think it's also valuable to be discussed. Um, what is of, of value in the way that Indiana Jones is defending objects and their meaning and 
treating them with respect and where they belong. Because I think there are times where even if it's flawed, mm -hmm. the intent of the story is for him to say it, it belongs, uh, mm -hmm. it, it should be treated with respect and it should be left alone or returned. I, I, no, I really agree with you there. And, 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 you know, we, we always hear at, at other center, try to make sure we're choosing our words carefully and, and, and go into the pop culture of it all. But like I said, it does have real world aspects. I, I, I think the, I think the, this is why I'm fascinated by what they, but I'm not saying this will be dealt with in 85. I'm just like, you have a different time. Mangold's writing this, putting this together in a different era. And, and this is now more of a, a conversation that's had, or you might be more aware of it. Like, so maybe I, I think the character of Indy might agree with that conversation now. And maybe always would where Belog is the example of um, what my people might be fighting against. And, and, and I, I mm -hmm. think it's fair to say, again, the context of the time. And then and it's, 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 it's always a discussion of, of movies from a different era. Um, I think it's okay for me, for me as a person, I think it's a, when I watch even some, my favorite comedies, when you watch them and you kind of go, Ooh, it's, 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 it's a reminder of where we were. And, and it's a, where we should go. And, and I think I'm okay with that in films. I don't want it to hurt anybody and I don't want to point and say, see the movie did it. It's okay. Uh, I'm just saying it is a, uh, it's a signpost on our hopeful, hopefully our, our, our path of growth. Yeah. Uh, but I, and I think some of the tensions in Indy, the, the, the character and his actions, um, what he's standing up for, what he's standing against. Uh, I, I, I agree with you there that, um, the intent, it, it might be more warmer than maybe it might look like. Yeah, that is a, a very great quick way to say it. I think the intent is warmer mm -hmm. <laughs> than sometimes what the general cultural memory of the, mm -hmm. of the film is. Yeah. Or, or the films. So it'll be really fun to, to look at that and discuss it, uh, as we go. And you're right. If, if the intent has been to show respect for objects of power, objects of meaning, the cultures that they're they're attached to, um, Indiana Jones wants knowledge. He wants to understand people and in, in their yeah. beliefs, right? Yeah. If that's always been the intent, but the sort of the the telephone game, the the meme nature of communication has just turned that into Indiana Jones as an image of of somebody who plunders. Yeah. Then maybe the modern film being made now is in a position to say, let's make sure that the intent is extremely clear and resonant. Yeah. 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 And not to boil it down, it's simple, but it's like, again, going to the Belog and, and Indiana Jones comparisons, like uh, Belog is, is never, I don't, I don't, you don't get a lot of respect for the cultures. He claims, oh, I know them better than you. And uh, you know, they don't know you well enough. They don't know you like I do. And Indies, it's a different, it's always uh, a thirst for knowledge, some sort of respect, it, it, even in some of the stuff in Temple of Doom at the dinner table scene, which has, again, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, um, but, but yeah, I, 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 again, intent versus character like that. Uh, yeah. Final thought for me is there's all these big, important issues, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a fact of, you know, I've, I've worked in museums. I'm not an archaeologist, but, you know, right. when yeah, I worked at have, uh, yeah, yeah. Mill City Museum in, Minneapolis, it is a, a, a partially new building built inside the burned down ruins of one of the original flour mills that that led to General Mills. It's, mm. you know, the, one of the buildings that's the reason there's the city of Minneapolis. It's a fascinating, weird place. Uh, some of the exhibits are old of uh, flour equipment. Some of them are like original uh, Pillsbury Doughboy ads. Wow. That entire building is kept at an exact temperature <laughs> and no one who works there would ever be allowed to open any exhibit and touch it. So kind of coming from that perspective, it's, it's an adventure movie. I don't need realism, but it's hilarious when Indy's like, this is a thousand years old or, you know, 10,000 years old. Nobody's seen it a long time. Let me touch it with my naked fingers. Let me blow on it. Let me rip a part of it off so I can read the rest of it. It's, He's a comically bad preservationist. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> do you ever uh, do you ever think about that? Are you ever affected by that when you're when you're watching him? Like just absolutely rough handle, you know, a, an ancient scroll. Uh, well, yes, because that's how I would do it, and I'm not saying that's <laughs> right. I'm a clumsy ox, and and I think that's another part of his appeal. Uh, again, the intent, the purpose. Um, but yes, yeah, no, I um, I totally get it for for. Lord, uh, a good part of the actually around Indy 
uh, four. I was around uh, geologists a lot, uh, academics, uh, Occidental College was up there a lot, former uh, relationship. And uh, yeah, they would not approve of any of his actions in terms of preservation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I love that stuff. Yeah. And that, that part is just, to me, it's just, you know, comedic. It's the same way that on any given uh, television show, the driver of a car will look at the passenger way more than they should. Way it's much. The same sort of comedy of why can there never be actual liquid in a coffee cup? It's just, it's a little <laughs> bit of that, you know, the difference between reality and fantasy. You know, but, I don't want to see Indy yeah. actually be like, yep, uh, it's life or death what's on this scroll, but can we test the temperature <laughs> before I expose it to the air? Yeah, look, we all have those, right? Like, I mean, you don't ever watch a movie where one of the characters is a radio DJ with me because I would be like, that's nope, nope, <laughs> that ain't it. Nope, they don't do that. That's uh, where's their headphones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Do people know that that microphones can't sense awkward mo- m- you know moments <laughs> to give random feedback for no reason? <laughs> Gross point blank is one of my favorite scenes. But uh, anytime he confronts many driver, I'm like, that's that's ooh, that's not how it works. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> so I get Andy. I get Andy. Yeah. Speaking of getting Indy, let's talk about relationships. Um. Uh, how do you feel about Indiana Jones' uh, relationships with women? Do you think he'd be an an easy person to be in a relationship with? Horrendous. Uh, horrendous. Uh, I've mentioned this before. Our, our pal, Mark Ellis, uh, stand-up comic. I'm always on the road with him. We have a running conversation about movies that are about stand-up comedy and comics without being about them. Indy is one of those. Always on the road, uh, kind of mo- about a difficult, surly, just kind of wants to be left alone. But, you know, he, he likes to dip his... Uh, toe in the waters of love every now and then he gets lonely, you know, it's, 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 it's like dating a comic and it ain't easy. And, um, and you mentioned some of the, even some of the real world controversial stuff there. Yeah. You know, he's, you know, come on, age up a little Indy. He's, uh, he's, he's got some problems. He got some problems. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, there's a lot in the Indiana Jones movies that are holdovers from the storytelling era that inspired, uh, Indiana Jones. There's a bunch of great stuff from that. We talked about the serial adventure and this great mixing of uh, the supernatural with this sort of James Bond vibe and all these great things. But I, I think a little bit for me, the the romance uh, is in updating of, you know, uh, 30s, 40s, where you, you get that a little bit of that old school swagger, a little bit of that, uh, you know, mm-hmm. romance is bickering. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, romance is yelling at each other until you have to kiss and like, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, by the way, <laughs> that's been a problem for me my entire life too. Uh, I, I was always very confused by it because I was like, uh, everything I watch, it, 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 w- it would appear to me that <laughs> yes. cinema is telling me that people like to be yelled at. Like, I've never experienced that. I don't yeah. Like, yeah. And I know, I, I understand every relationship is different. And 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 I certainly have known or experienced, uh, you know, moments where, where you know, it, you're, you're, you're mm-hmm. passionate. And, and uh, I think there's this fine line of like, yeah, no, a- a- anger in, in relationships, hey, we want to be careful with that. But the intent yeah. here, I think, is the, that sort of romantic bickering vibe. Yeah, yeah, Tracy Hepburn and all this stuff. I mean, look, every relationship I've, uh, I'm in, and, and including the, the the permanent one now, it's like, oh, we're not, we're not Han and Leia in the hallway, on Hoth and Echo Base. It's not it. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I, you know, uh, I think uh, some people experience that. Some people have that that the sort of the the fiery odd mm-hmm. couple, the opposites mm-hmm. attract. You know, and yeah. and not everybody does either. Um, I think you know the the age difference you know with marion is you know uh, n- not not great for me um yeah. all, all that stuff but uh marion herself is is amazing uh just yeah. a, a phenomenal character right her introduction is w- one of the many things that makes raiders absolutely amazing the whole uh, drinking under the table this is her bar <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> you know mm-hmm totally uh, updating you know ripped from the the screenplays of, of bogart and bacall films mm-hmm. uh, marion absolutely amazing mm-hmm. how do you feel about about marion and about marion as the sort of uh the the other women we see in the films you know the main ones uh, willie scott uh mm-hmm. elsa uh, are l- love interest romantic partners but marion is is the one how do you feel about that I, I, I think number. I think that's accurate, right? It, it ne- never quite worked. It never quite felt the same. Uh, and that's uh, Allison Duty and Kate Cash, Capshaw do. I think great jobs with those guys. Like uh, uh, Elsa, love love the character. 
Um, much to talk about there. I, I like what Willie Scott is there for. Like it, it, it's, it's, it's sometimes she's annoying and I'm like, Oh, that's the point. And then we can analyze the why of that and talk about that. But it, it, it Marion is the gold standard, right? And you say, you talk about just from film discussion, you know, in a bar, I think that that scene is one of the more, if not the most perfect character introduction. Indies is also pretty damn good at the beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. But in terms of introducing a character, you learn everything you need to know about that character. That's one of my favorite sequences in all of film. Uh, another reason I love indie and love the thing. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it worked. I think I think it was just uh, the 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 give and take, the balance, everything they presented with that character. It's it's so good. It's so good. So good. And even though there's some problematic elements. Uh, you're welcome to society. Maybe it's, maybe we should look at that anyways. I mean, as we're, as we're recording, there's some laws in states about certain ages being allowed to do certain, it's, it's there's, the, there's a problem in society and the way men mm-hmm. look at young women. And, and, and it's, it's just, uh, you know, by the way, I, I'll confess, I, I, I'm in a relationship where I, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite indie, but I'm older, you know, <laughs> I'm more great. Right. So yeah, it's, it's a real world thing, but um, it, it never stood out to me, but can I just say it never stood out to me until it started becoming part of the conversation. Uh, on to online, I, I knew yeah. Marion's line. I got it, but I so I that some of that conversation is valuable for me to then go look at the movie. Go oh, okay, maybe maybe someone should talk to Andy. Maybe <laughs> maybe Phoebe Waller Bridge will. <laughs> uh, I would not be surprised. And yeah, I think I think that's something that that we talk about with Star Wars and it'll come up with Indiana Jones too. Of of it is a larger cultural thing and even down to we talked about in the clone wars animated series absolutely adore obi-wan and Mm -hmm. uh satine's romance that was even made that long ago but but their their whole great three episode arc introduction like by the end i was like obi-wan stop grabbing her elbow yeah (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. if she wants to keep talking to you she'll turn around stop it uh but it but it isn't like how did those awful creators do that? It's that this was a language that's been built up by culture that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. this is an element of, you know, fiery romance, which mm-hmm. I, that needs to be questioned. So I think when we're questioning these w- films, I think it's, you're really right to say we're questioning mm-hmm. those larger ideas and how did they end up manifested here? Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but as it is, and as it is in Raiders, I mean, Marion is, is f- perfection to me on, on screen. Karen Allen yeah. is just amazing. Yeah, and, and I, I, it's one of the things I love about Kingdom of the Crypt, Crystal Skull is kind of bringing it back to, like, yeah, y- you were always the one, you know, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. they seem like they both care about each other and there's such a match for one another. And it seems like that that bickering is because that's really who they both are, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I absolutely love that. All right, you, you, uh, you discussed some of this a little bit earlier, but I want to dive into uh, perhaps the most challenging question. What is the difference between these three people? Indiana Jones, Han Solo, and Harrison Ford. Uh, one of them may have eaten at Scrambles in my hometown, as we discussed <laughs> recently. Um, someone shared a quote. I saw a quote recently. Never trust a quote on the internet, right? But it was like Harrison Ford literally saying, there is no difference. They're all me type of vibe. Um, <laughs> but even then, I don't think that's necessarily accurate. This is something I, I look at um, now with uh, adult eyes. Am I really adult? No, not really. But uh, age-wise, I am. I, you know, Indy is um, – I, I look up to Indy for the commitment. I look at Han and learn a lot about myself, as I've said before, especially older Han. That was stunning to stand alone and go, oh, this character that I really loved and looked up to my whole life, I probably should have learned more lessons from Han Solo. <laughs> Indy's got a lot. That can, we could teach, but even the, some of the stuff you and I are talking about around some of the more controversial real world discussions to have of Indy, I think his heart is always there and he's always on the right side. And now, you know, uh, the, I hate Nazis conversation memes, you know, has even more value, I think, in the real <laughs> world. But uh, Indy's never, I don't think Indy's wavered from what is right, how to do it, how to get there, and how involved he wants to be, maybe, but his drive is always to go forward and always to do, um, was right for the bigger picture, I think. Uh, and that's one of the biggest differences. They're played the same. Harrison's an amazing actor. I think he's shown range in other product, uh, projects, but also he's also at the time, uh, you know, one of the biggest movie stars in the world. And sometimes you d- you just want Harrison Ford. You don't want a character actor, right? I get it. 
I get it. And he's Harrison. He's Harrison through and through. Uh, also, Indy and Han seem more sober uh, in terms of uh, marijuana than Harrison. But um, <laughs> that's a different conversation. <laughs> I mean, Han, uh, yeah. maybe. I don't know. But Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a real fun conversation to have. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember uh, the the Cohen brothers talking about uh, their only real conversation with Jeff Bridges while making the Big Lebowski is him walking up to them and going, "Do, do you think the dude just burned one? Like that's the <laughs> that was the only direction he ever wanted of." And they're always like, "Yeah, he probably did. <laughs> he probably did." <laughs> uh, uh, fun mm-hmm. to imagine uh, if Jeff Bridges did end up playing uh, yeah. Indiana Jones. Yeah. Uh, my joke answer about the difference between these three characters is an earring and that's it. Yeah, um, yeah. but my real answer is I, I do think that there is Harrison Ford perspective and charm that deeply bonds Han Solo and in, in Indiana Jones. But I think there is a huge and fundamental difference. And I think that goes back to, you know, Indiana Jones being about swagger and books, you know, mm-hmm. Han Solo is, is interested in his, ego in his legend he is trying to bury his feelings uh he, he really does not want to admit that he cares right that's one of the defining things about han solo from the very beginning he does not want to admit he cares about luke or leia or the cause he just wants his money he wants everybody to believe that about about him and when he turns around and helps luke and the rebels in the first film anyway He's still like, I was going to let you take all the reward and credit, right? Yeah. He's even like, don't don't paint me with your feelings brush, right? Yeah. And that continues to be his journey with all of the great uh, Han Solo faces emotions on a bridge from Return of the Jedi to The Force Awakens. Yeah. Um, I think, I think there's some, uh, let's not talk about it, let's be stoic uh, that goes on with Indiana Jones and feelings. Uh, sure. Particularly by the time... He's wrestling with that explicitly in in Last Crusade. But I think, like we were talking about earlier, uh, Indiana Jones cares a lot. He's borderline obsessive, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I think if if a person wasn't involved, if there was no emotional stake and you told Han Solo, you have to get this object, he'd be like, eh, really? How much? <laughs> you know? Yeah, okay. right. If he made an emotional connection and he and you know, like with like with Enfys Nest and he understood why it would help a person, then he'd yeah. do it, right? But you could yeah. just tell Indiana Jones, if you get this cipher, you can decode this these volumes of obscure text. I think he'd be like, "F yeah, where's my bullwhip?" Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think there is a sort of um a compulsion in a nerdery, <laughs> yeah, that motivates Indiana Jones that doesn't motivate Han Solo in the same way. I I, I think. I mean, you know, say this with, with Hans, Han Solo being my favorite Star Wars character. Han's a poser for most of his life. He, <laughs> he, he wants to be a scoundrel. That's why Kira's moment with him is so powerful to me. And the moment in the most wanted novel where she kind of sees who he truly is and and how he um, runs away from that. Han's a poser. Indiana Jones is authentic. To a fault, maybe, like you said. Obsessed at times. Stubborn at times. Um, flawed indeed, but but always who he is. He's always uh, aware of what he needs to do and, and, and where he is in that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think to your point, I think the, what bonds them and is similar is uh, n- not only is Harrison Ford just made of charm, but I think <laughs> he he just mm. unlocked this beautiful thing. I think other performers have done it over time. I, I think a, a ton of performers do it now. It's written into scripts now, I think, because of his, his success. Um, but this idea of let them see you bleed that's the harrison ford magic right like told them that eventually comes to james bond but early on like james bond was a fantasy in in the films in particular and you, you didn't uh the original producers resisted for years and years and years to go back and tell his origin story because like who wants to see james bond trip and get hurt nobody yeah. right mm-hmm. that was their perspective especially because because they were older and i think you know the the people coming up um you know, they're the original James Bond producers, you know, uh, proteges were like, you did, like yeah, look at Harrison Ford. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, look at the way it's even more impressive that he did that because every single part of him hurts. You <laughs> talked a lot about how, he, how he's fallible, but Harrison, and you can write that, but Harrison Ford plays that. It takes mm-hmm. nothing away from his cool, from his swagger, 
mm-hmm. uh, that he fell down eight times while doing that. It only makes him more cool. And, and Harrison Ford just plays that to perfection. I, yeah, I, I really, really love what you're saying there. Um, the hurts all over thing really works. It, it, it really is um, a great way to look at it is, is, is the club Obi-Wan sequence, right? A direct, mm-hmm. Hey, you know, let's do it as bond and everything goes wrong. <laughs> everything goes wrong. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, even, even when they escape, it's wrong. Right. And, and, and uh, Dan Aykroyd showing up there and they get on the wrong plane. It, it's just, um, and I think that's one of the things I, that's why I love that sequence too. But yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Very, very great sequence of continually going wrong. <laughs> uh, so we do want to be sure, uh, since we're doing other center here, uh, jumping off of Force Center to talk a little bit of Star Wars. We just talked about Han Solo, but let's talk about the connections between Star Wars and Indiana Jones. Obviously, this is uh, George Lucas's other adventure serial matinee inspired franchise. Uh, Harrison Ford, John Williams, Lawrence Kasdan, uh, Club Obi-Wan, a, a scary government agent played by Porkins. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tons of behind the scenes, you know, creative and tech people involved. ILM, right? Um, mm-hmm. How does that relationship to Star Wars affect your love of Indiana Jones? It's fascinating because it's also, you know, owned by a different studio, right? So it, it, it's not in Disney Plus. It, it's, it's, you know, it's an interesting thing, but yet, yet, you know, here we got Indy 5, we got the Lucasfilm Studio Showcase at Celebrations that Indy's there. And so it's a, it's, it's weird. And that's, that's the corporate side of it there. But I've always, uh, I've always enjoyed the connections, but it's always felt, um, weird in a way. I, I almost said off, but that's not correct. Like seeing pictures of, of George on a indie set still seems just wonderfully awkward to me. Like, what's he doing there? What's he doing? There? <laughs> it's a story. Um, I, I've had, a, I'm fascinated by it. I'm, I'm fascinated by the exchange. We're, you know, getting to eventually the young and Indian Jones Chronicles here, but like uh, that it, we have the prequels, I think because of Indiana Jones Chronicles, you know, like, mm-hmm. and, and the, the crossovers are powerful. So, it's all the same, but I never think of them the same. I never connect them other than the names and, and, everything, and the things you're talking about, the history. I yeah. enjoy them separately in a weird way. You know, that, that's really fascinating. I, I, I think I'm the same. I think when I'm just sitting and watching them, there's there's the Harrison Ford charm and, and mm-hmm. you know, you you, you can, uh, you know, feel Han Solo in, in Bespin of being in pain and <laughs> they never even ask me any questions. Like, yeah, that, yeah. that's a real Indiana Jones moment. Um. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are those direct connections that we just talked about, but other than that, it's, it's, it's structural. Um, yeah, yeah. I do think as we dive deeper, there are some thematic things. I, I think there's some very George Lucas things where, in mm-hmm. my opinion, his, his heart is always in the right place and he's really advocating for some, some powerful and, and great ideas and, and maybe mm-hmm. flawed in the way that he says them, which, mm-hmm you know, we talked about and we'll talk about more, but the intent is so similar to Star Wars of, you know, mm-hmm. knowledge, respect. Um, there, there's, maybe there's more more powers than we are aware of, you know. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of big thematic ideas, but the experience of watching it is less affected by the Star Wars similarity than thinking about the behind the scenes and the impact of them, you know? Yeah. You just made me think of something interesting about George too, and the relation, and, and this so so much of it coming from from him, especially in, in Raiders and Temple. But like um, how uh, George, uh, I I think I think George doesn't necessarily want to be a filmmaker, but he knows he can and has to sometimes to get his message across. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. yeah, for the greater cause. Uh, yeah, we need to do this. He'd probably like to just stay in some you know, laboratory coming up with film tech or something like that. And he clearly loves these stories and he clearly is a filmmaker and all those things, especially, uh, you know, look, look at him emerging from USC. But sometimes it just feels like, you know, I have some powerful things I want to get out there into the world. And I guess the only way I can really do it is to making these films. And uh, much like Andy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it, that is what's fascinating about them, of them coming from a similar place from, from Lucas and, and Spielberg, but, but Lucas yeah. is the one who kind of kicks it all off, right? That totally. this fascination with older styles of storytelling that fired his imagination mm-hmm. and he wants to fire other people's imagination the way his was, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of a a different story. The the effect that that had 
uh, it might have just been one thing if Star Wars was an outlier, but he was like, I, I kind of did it again. I looked back to mm-hmm. other kinds of stories from my youth that made me feel this amazing call to adventure. And I want other people to feel that amazing call of adventure. So Star Wars and Indiana Jones both having the same uh, general genesis mm-hmm. in, in its intent, I think made a much larger impact in yeah. in the face of storytelling, right? Um, yeah, yeah just kind of looking back at the past and going what what really affected me as as a kid how can i bring that into the modern how can i bring that into the present i think we're in a different cycle of that because we are in a in a place where it's instead of let me x files change my life let me make let me make something that makes other people feel like x files we'll just reboot x files that's a yeah. you know a larger discussion we're in a different place with that but i think it's powerful that both of these franchises were in the business of I want to make other people feel what I felt. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think the other connection between Star Wars and Indiana Jones that, that makes me uh, really intrigued by their connection is the behind the scenes. Is We're preparing for this podcast. I got distracted on the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, Wikipedia page because it's it's just fascinating that making the first film wasn't that easy for them. Like, you think, right. like, Oh yeah, the, the 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 two people who arguably changed cinema the most right. in, in their time they wanted to do another. So I'm sure everybody was just like, you know, <laughs> here, here's here's a money shower. Like, uh, yeah. no, Lucas was demanding a lot. Spielberg was just coming off of uh, one of his only failures of 1941. Spielberg mm-hmm. was often over budget, and you know, it, yeah. it makes all that behind the scenes stuff even more fascinating to put it in actual, you know, history. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I want more of those stories. There's far too few indie docs out there, I think. Yeah, more indie docs. Uh, speaking of more indie, I do just want to touch uh, briefly on the uh, non-movie Indiana Jones storytelling. Um, I want to touch on your memories or relationship with the young Indiana Jones television show. Did you watch that uh, when it was broadcast? How did you feel about it? I absolutely watched it. I do not think I missed an episode. I, I, I loved it, but I also undervalued it. I don't have a lot of detailed memories of the series. I'm trying to remember the exact year. Early 90s, I know. Mm-hmm. High school, a lot of things going on. Uh, you know, I'm not watching Star Wars as much there. Uh, trying to be, become an adult, whatever that. I should have just learned early. Stick with what you know, kid. Uh, but I loved it. I loved it. But it was truly a time of TV is less than. Mm-hmm. And I think the show was way ahead of its time and what it was trying to do. Uh, imagine now, you know, if the, if, if, if the young Indiana Jones Chronicles did not exist, it would be on Disney Plus right now. Whether it George, I would want George to be involved, uh, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> and Rick McCallum. But uh, it just would make some sense. With, in, in some of the stuff you're talking about earlier about, hey, let's, you know, reboot all the stuff, the bigger conversations. I think it was way ahead of its time, way ahead of the time it was trying to do. This was this was the era of watching sitcoms for me. And here you got this hour long historical, historically based show with this character that I know I love, but it's a different version of him, not just age or something else going on. So I, I, I've, I undervalued it. I really did undervalue it, even though I loved it. Um, and when it was done and wrapped up, there was the movies and all the stuff. I just it became this pop culture trivia answer for me. Hmm. Versus something that I remember uh, really enjoying, even though I did. So, yeah, you know, Sean Patrick Flannery, he was young. Indy, uh, you know, now I know that his da- the, the, the guy who played his his dad in the series goes on to uh, appear in Rings of Power, by the way. He's an excellent job uh, in there. Um, is the Seal Door's father. So, uh, yeah, I, that's all I know it as. And I can't wait to revisit it because I love it. And, and I re- like I said earlier, I really think that's the reason we have the prequels because George was like, Hey, this guy Rick knows what he's doing. He can chomp and gum, making stuff. <laughs> Maybe got some good people here. Let's let's do some more. Yeah, um, I, I I'm so fascinated by this television show. I I like I said, I really just seen the movies back in the in in that time. There weren't a lot of like, hey, we're gonna bring even the tiniest element of a massive cinema franchise to television. Yeah, you know, like mm-hmm. maybe you'd get like a weird knockoff like the <laughs> the Ghostbusters cartoon. Uh, I know there's some huge fans of Ghostbusters cartoon, so uh, mm-hmm. absolutely uh, all due respect there. I love the Cthulhu episode. Um, 
but it, 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 it felt like something to, to, to take notice of. Right. Yeah. And I had a little bit of that, like, okay, well, yeah, it's not, it's not as explosive and, and action packed as the movies. And yeah, I like the ones where he's a teenager a little bit more than the ones where he's, you know, uh, yeah. a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I watched every episode. I was engaged uh, by the time it kind of structurally got into he, he's involved in literal wars and there's mm-hmm. ongoing stories. And, I, you know, worried about <laughs> indie from week to week. You know, yeah. um, I was really invested in it and thought it was really cool um, mm. and hope it hoped it was kind of like a harbinger of things to come of like, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a Star Wars television show? Yeah. You know, um, God, yeah, yeah. The, the history of the thing is fascinating. Yeah. If you want to mm-hmm. know anything about how the Star Wars prequels happened from the technical to what's in George Lucas's heart and soul, the, the Indiana Jones Chronicles is like a making of for the prequels. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, the, if people don't know this, you know, it was it was broadcast in a specific way where it had bookends from older Indiana Jones and it it jumped around in time. So you'd have one week it'd be an episode with a teen indie, one episode season or week it'd be a, a kid. Uh, he totally special editioned it and reworked it. So it was in chronological order, shot new scenes, took out the bookends. You can't find the original versions. Mm -hmm. He did uh, this massive, massive DVD project where he made extensive documentaries about the historical figures and places and issues that went with everything and and gave the DVDs to schools to be like, uh, Indiana Jones is your tour on the history of the 20th century. Here you go. Um, And then, it, it is just, you know, hey, there's Shmi. Hey, there's Seal Bibble. Hey, it's that's not right. just Rick McCallum. It's that's right. David Tattersall. It's uh, Trisha Bagar. It's yes. uh, the yes. costume designer. It's just like, this is the, I'm I'm watching the making of the prequels. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So they oh, unfortunately pulled it down from Paramount Plus, but my wife and I watched uh, through the young, the kid indie mm. up until, I think we watched the first episode where he was a teen and then they pulled it down in Oh, I enjoyed it so much because, yeah, like the prequels, you could go like, well, that's flawed. That's weird. He's an adventure hero. N- nothing that exciting happened. But like, but what's at stake? What's he learning? It's about the relationship with his father. It's about him learning respect for other cultures. It's about him having a, a, a larger world view. It's about him learning. There's some there's some episodes where like, you know, spunky kid Indiana Jones, you know, is told I believe by the president of the United States that he can't go help that person. And he's like, Roosevelt is wrong. <laughs> we have to help people. And, you know, yeah. Roosevelt's like, that kid reminded me of basic values. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it can be looked at as cheesy, but it can also be looked at as Lucas's mission to be like, mm-hmm. these things that we write off as cheesy are actually the, the heart of what we need to be a better society. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I wish I could go back and revisit them. I, I didn't have the, Paramount Plus when I, I remember you were saying you and Sarah were watching them and I, cause I just, the, the memories are very vague. Like, and I've gone, by the way, I've gone through uh, both on Wikipedia and there is a, a fandom owned, uh, you know, uh, indie wiki they purchased at some point across uh, the times. Okay. Uh, I, I've gone through and done like the episode by episode, like what happens and some of the story, you're, it's fascinating stuff. You can get lost in that because like, I, I was like, God, I, he has a French buddy. They're in World War One. Like, he, like it just—it's all vague, and I just would love to experience again because I'm sure the stuff that's there is that you're saying, as you're saying, a little bonkers, a little wild, but also important. Yeah, and some really, in in some of them are just like it, truly, truly great episodes of of television, in mm-hmm. in my opinion. So well, uh, yeah, and, yeah. And you're talking about the air, the air. This is also we, you know, there was a Ferris Bueller's Day Off TV show. I think Jennifer Aniston played the Jennifer Grey character. Like, like there's that stuff and, and none of it was working. And so this kind of, again, talk about ahead of its time, Indy 4 coming out in an era where we weren't quite understanding how we wanted to bring things back uh, uh, and do new stories with these characters we love. Uh, the, that show sits in a weird era of television where it was so ahead of its time. Yeah. And, it, and it's George Lucas is, is an iconoclast, which he mm-hmm. always is of like, yeah, I, it, it, maybe it'll be successful enough, but I'm pouring all of my own money into uh, traveling across the actual bleeping globe. The, mm-hmm. You know, this is not shot in in a studio. A bunch of it is yeah. on location, and that 
weird obsessive commitment of Lucas to do things his way is, yeah. is really evident in the show as well. Mm. Fascinating. Uh, so what uh, what other indie have you uh, absorbed? There's the the ride we were joking about at, at Disney, the Indiana Jones Adventure, Temple of the Forbidden Eye. There are video games. There are some books, uh, more modern action figures. How else have you engaged with Indiana Jones? Yeah, um, fascinating. I, this question, looking at it um, prior to recording, I was like, God, the answer is almost zero. None of the books, uh, none of the computer games. But one of my favorite all-time video games is the first Indiana Jones Lego game. The second one, they rushed it a little bit. It's a little wonky. But the first Lego Indiana Jones game raised the bar for that game series. The Star mm-hmm. Wars ones had been out. They were good. They were very good. Um, this one took it to a new level. And it's really fun. Really fun game to play. So I loved that. But I didn't engage in the other ones. But the ride... I love the ride and I know it's going to uh, go and it's shut down right now for a re- refurb uh, leading up to dial of destiny, which is great. Can't wait for that. But I mean, I, and I, I love that ride. I, love, I, I fall for the magic every time I am. Uh, I know I'm, I'm someone who loves going to Disney, uh, Disneyland in Anaheim anyways, but I'm the one who loves, uh, <laughs> I'll say this carefully, yanking on the pole <laughs> that makes the sound. <laughs> Uh, cause there's that, there's, there's a lot of hidden little things you can do in the quay, a quay, a queue. What am I learning how to speak now? Um, I'm the one who's like all excited to show everyone that you can make the spikes come down. If you just yank hard enough right here, uh, <laughs> that's me. I, I, I stop and listen, um, uh, to, uh, 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 Sala. I'm the one who's like, yeah, yeah. Don't look at the eye. Like I fall for it every time. I love the magic. And I, I believe I have good luck in that, right? I, I've told a lot of people I have been handed, uh, fast passes by strangers almost every time I walk up to the ride. Like, hey, you need mm-hmm. these? And I was telling someone that the, la- the last time we were at Disneyland, and it happened again. The, the ride, the love I have for that ride is it pays it pays it back to me. I love that ride. Uh, it was a dream for me when it first uh, came, just like Star Tours was, but even better than Star Tours for me. I just felt so much part of this world. And I and again, I didn't play the video games, but there there are a lot. But it wasn't as popular. The figures. Different environment, uh, man, than Star Wars when it came to the figures. Uh, they didn't work as much. My friends didn't have them. We weren't playing them on the playground. So the ride shows up, and it just felt finally I, I, I was part of this franchise. I felt like I was indie. Seems cheesy, but it worked on me to the point where I always wanted one of the hats. I could never find it. Again, you look in the mirror, I'm like, I can't get this hat. Uh, finally, some some wonderful uh, friends of mine um, got uh, me the hat like two years ago. And it was like, oh, finally, <laughs> finally, I got the hat. And it all comes from that ride. So of all those things on that list, that ride is the thing that uh, is probably my favorite. Yeah, uh, definitely for me. Um, I, I haven't played the Lego. Uh, I, I picked up a novel. I don't think it's a novelization of an episode. I think it is an epi- just another mm-hmm. young Indiana Jones adventure. I picked that up at a used bookstore on my birthday. Mm-hmm. Uh, partially because the connections just won't end. It's written by James Lucino. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, who yeah. Star Wars fans know uh, yeah. is a is a, a beloved uh, Star Wars uh, author. Mm-hmm. Um, I bought the N64 game, I believe the Infernal Machine uh, for my brother. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm Googling it and it, it had a good score, but my brother was like, yeah, it's terrible. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess GameSpot calls it most disappointing game of the year. Uh, so anyway... Uh, I've never played it myself. I am vaguely aware of some strong opinions about it. Um, the ride for me is also one of the other ways that I've experienced it the most. Um, I've been on that ride uh, three or four times, uh, but they're all memorable. Um, yeah. There are, there are, Disney always does, you know, an amazing job to try to make the lines engaging. Yeah. But Indiana Jones is the one that I'd be like, I, I don't, I don't want to skip the line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I almost like the line just as much as the ride itself because mm. it is so that you're going to an interesting, different place. You are descending into something ancient and dangerous, and you need to be careful. And you know mm. all of the the great information that's given over old newsreels and. Mm-hmm. I'm just so into the aesthetic of it. I'm so into the storytelling of it. I didn't even know you could yank the pole. <laughs> yeah, you got to yank the pole, kids. Yank the pole. It happens. Well, there. I'm going to get a dole whip and yank the pole <laughs> the next time I'm in Adventureland. Uh, uh, man, but and then the actual ride is great. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I have a, a stand-up bit about going to 
Disneyland once where like a bunch of the rides were just slightly broken in ways that affected the narrative. And it happened to me on, on this ride where, uh, no, no huge spoilers. There's a moment where you see Indiana Jones, he's hanging from a rope and then something dramatic is supposed to happen, but the dramatic thing didn't. So <laughs> Indiana Jones was just hanging on a rope <laughs> above our Jeep, just kind of awkwardly to the point where there was just silence and somebody was like, Hey, Indy, how's it going? <laughs> and then the ride kind of kicked into gear again. So. Yeah, that's good. Many, many uh, happy memories of that. Can't wait to go back. Uh, <laughs> we are heading in to wrapping up in mm. classic, classic four center tradition. We're like probably about 90 minutes, probably going to go over that. <laughs> maybe try to keep it under two hours and just like indiana jones we're gonna just squeak in at our goal got a couple of fun questions uh to wrap up our first chapter of the perilous podcast uh, ken what other stories should have a map showing people's travel with lines i wish i had a funnier answer or wittier answer but i'm gonna go back to lord of the rings which does have maps involved <laughs> Um, number one, I'm fascinated with, I love the indie stuff. I'm fascinated with maps. I'm fascinated with maps with movies like Lord of the Rings or books like Song of Ice and Fire. Cause I study them. I pull them out and, and I study them. It helps me appreciate the stories, helps me get into them. And it just helps me understand where things are. I think sometimes Lord of the Rings does need that on the screen. And, and in the Rings of Power, they did that a little bit. I love that series. It's not for everybody. I get it. I get it. A lot of Tolkien lore heads maybe had some problems with it, but hey, we'll fight in a bar about that one day. Tolkien lore heads. I love the show and it has a little bit of it there, but it reminds me in Indy, not in the adventure serial way, but there's just something cool. It also is a great device to explain some time. Uh, I think maybe that would have helped in, in Game of Thrones when people were trying to understand how long it took people to run places or go on ships. If you just go, yeah, they went here and it went this long. I think it works. I think it's fun. So I wish I, again, I wish I had like, you know, a comedy from the eighties that I could use, but I really, it's a great device and I'd love to see it in more uh, fantasy uh, genre films and shows. I, I love that. Yeah. I mean, Hey, fantasy and maps go together like oh, peanut yeah. butter and jelly. Right. Mm -hmm. But that idea, like what would it, what would it have done to show people how far mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the hound and Aria walked? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, if you could viscerally feel it, you know, it would, it would, mm -hmm change your perception of time for sure. Yeah. Um, I love it in Indiana Jones because it is, it, it, I think there's, that's another way to kind of be frankly nerdy about valuing knowledge to nerd out about maps. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and it's also like Indiana Jones. I think this is goes to one of, one of those things of um, uh, I think we'll end up talking about a lot where the, the intent is, is wonderful and, and there's plenty to be debated in the execution. But I think especially looking at Indiana Jones as a character, the way he's built up in the television show is he's traveled the world. He is, he's got a, a global perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, the lines showing him go all these places, you know, it, it really is about globe trotting. this idea of like, what would it be like to, to mm -hmm. be like, Hey, for you, just, you know, uh, going to Peru is like, yeah, I've been there uh, 17 times. It's like going to, uh, you know, my local grocery store, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, for Indiana Jones of like to be a true citizen of the world. Yeah. I, I think that's what it unlocks. Um, for me, imagining other, other things with it, the thing that comes to my mind as being really funny is uh, horror movies where the whole point is to not know where somebody mm. is like mm. i would love to see a version of jaws where you know they're like debating whether they should shut the beach and then we see a map of like here here's where the shark mm. is right now it went mm. from here That's to here to here <laughs> i love that the track and the villain yeah right the, 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 the scream movies are often you know they're often uh this is not a spoiler. Well, it's a spoiler if you've never seen a Scream movie. So sorry if you've never seen a Scream movie. But sometimes there's more than one killer. And sometimes the movies tell you clearly later on which of, of the people was doing which murder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so to see like <laughs> the little lines of they went to this house, they went to this room, then they took the cloak off, then they went over here. Like I would yeah. love that. Yeah, that'd be okay. It'd be working a video game too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right, here is uh, the final question for our first episode. Do you think Indiana Jones would be a good guest on a podcast? I absolutely think he would. Yes, yes. 
actually would. Harrison, not so much. It'd be entertaining. You better ask the right questions, depending on what mood you get him in. Could be great. Could be bad. Han would be like, get out of here. He's like, this is the stuff that Lando does. I don't have time for this. Anybody, ain't nobody got time for this. But I think Andy would be happy to talk, but you, it'd be that kind of situation where, you know, especially if you meet a celebrity or someone out in the wild, like y- y- you don't want to be, you don't want to talk to them about the thing that they're maybe most associated with. Right. So if you meet a Star Wars director, you might talk about their influences versus Star Wars. Right. Maybe they don't want to talk about it. I don't know. It's just I can't think of a specific example right now. Um, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, once I met Pablo Hidalgo once at a premiere and I was like, I'd love to talk to, about G.I. Joe with you. And he was like, oh, I'd love to do that. Like, he doesn't want to talk about Star Wars. I mean, let's talk about G.I. Joe. <laughs> so if you were like you had Indiana Jones and you were talking about the academic stuff, talking about the actual items, the history, and all the things you and I were discussing versus the adventure. He'd, he'd be on board. But if you were like, hey, I heard you fought some Nazis, you'd be like, hey, yeah, kid, you're supposed to do that. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about what I was doing out there. You know, that's that's where I think you'd have to go. I absolutely agree with you. You know, if, if it is a swagger in books, I ask him the book questions. I, I do so much research about archaeology, about philosophy behind archaeology, mm-hmm. about, you know, specific questions about artifacts that are still missing and what his take on it is. I, I think he'd be the greatest podcast guest in the world. And once mm-hmm. you get him talking about all that stuff, I think maybe you could get a little bit into feelings or life experiences, right? If you kind of got there through uh, the legitimate archaeology questions. But if you just if you just lean into him and be like, how, how, you know, Chris Farley show him. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. How, how did it feel when the, the Nazi jacket didn't quite fit? Like, he'd just be like, get out of here. Like, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what was it like to be possessed? Like, I don't want to talk about it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> uh, good guess if you ask him about the book learning, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That is our first episode, Ken. Unless you have any final uh, big picture thoughts, take us home. No, hey, if you're listening to the original broadcast of, the, of these on our Patreon page, thank you for your uh, longtime support. But we are releasing these episodes to the public. So instead of doing a whole new outro, uh, thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed Other Center, our look at Indiana Jones at the Perilous Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Force Center Pod from there. You can get information on all the things we do. If you want to see me out there, including on my Instagram page, a picture of me in the in that Indiana Jones hat, uh, you can go to uh, at Cadnapsock or Cadnapsock.com. Joseph, where can they find you and your whip smacking adventures? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can find me on all the social media, Twitter, Instagram, Mastodon, all sorts of places is at Joseph Scrimshaw. And uh, you will probably not see a picture of me in an Indiana Jones hat, but you will maybe see a picture of some action figures of Indiana Jones coming soon. All right, my friends. Thank you for listening to Indiana Jones and the Perilous Podcast.